recording this. Mm -hmm. I wanted to thank everybody for being here today. Uh, we are in Tel Aviv, Jerusalem at uh, Sipur Pashut, which is a historic bookstore. So for us, it's an honor to be here uh, to present uh, the book Jews and Ukrainians, A Millennium of Coexistence is co-authored by Paul Robert Magucci, who is a professor at, uh, and chair of Ukrainian studies at the University of Toronto, and Johanna petrovsky Stern, who is a professor at Northwestern University. Um, with the war in Ukraine, um, I think that this book takes on uh, more active resonance um, because the question of Jews and Ukrainians and, and Vladimir Putin's uh, discussions about the need to denazify Ukraine, as we know, is one of the reasons why he unjustly invaded Ukraine. And Professor Maguchi, along with being um, a board member of Ukrainian Jewish Encounter, uh, which is a Canadian charitable nonprofit organization, um, is also an expert for the government of Ukraine. Uh, at the International Court in The Hague, and he has written about Crimea and just recently also wrote a paper uh, for, for the government as an expert witness on the current conflict. So I think what we will do today is we'll ask Professor Maguchi to say a few words about the book itself, um, how it came to be, uh, in his opinion, what is the uh, current importance of it, and uh, then perhaps we can um, ask a few questions and ask him about the paper that he wrote about Ukrainian statehood that debunks uh, the myths that Vladimir Putin has put out there about Ukraine not existing as a country. Um, so, Professor Matucci. Well, thank you very much, uh, Natalia. Uh, so, just a few words uh, from my side as Natalia just uh, alluded uh, regarding uh, this particular volume, which we uh, prepared a few years ago. Um, and it was kind of prepared with a certain goal in mind. Uh, and that goal is uh, to uh, provide some basic information uh, about not only the presence of Jews historically on the territory of what is today Ukraine, uh, but also to do so in a manner that it reveals not the Jews as an isolated community, whether that be in Ukraine or any other modern day country, but also the peoples, other peoples, and in particular the dominant people of the particular state uh, and their interaction. Uh, also, uh, I would say that this is not a history about uh, Jews, two things are wrong in that statement. Uh, first of all, it is not only about Jews, but it is about ethnic Ukrainians. And equal attention is given to both uh, Jews on the territory of Ukraine historically and ethnic Ukrainians. But the second thing is, is this is not a history. This is a compendium that one can see easily from the table of contents, which I can't see because, ah, one is not wrapped up. Uh, to remind me of what is in the, the table of contents. So, well, yes, granted, there is a, it's got 12 chapters, and granted there is a chapter on history, it's, it's part of the, the, it's part of the, the story, if you will. Uh, but it starts off with a, a chapter on geography, uh, then of course there's the history of the historical past, uh, on, and then there's one on economic life, on uh, traditional culture, which effectively would be more or less ethnography, uh, a special chapter on religion, not surprisingly, uh, one on 
language and publications, uh, one on uh, uh, literature, belletre, and theater, uh, one on architecture and art, uh, one on music, uh, a separate chapter on the diaspora, and a ch separate chapter on contemporary Ukraine. So as you can see, the effort here was to paint a picture in broad strokes of all aspects of uh, Jewish civilization on the territory of Ukraine and, on, um, and also on uh, all aspects of Ukrainian uh, culture. Uh, ethnic Ukrainian culture on the territory of Ukraine, with even a discussion of the diasporas of each of these communities. Also, the book is structured in such a way to consciously or unconsciously full, fulfill another goal. Um, without question, if someone picked up a book like this, uh, and uh, a person of Jewish background, who would know that their parents or grandparents, forebears came from the Ukraine, uh, they more than likely would be interested in uh, the, Jewish, the Jewish aspect of, uh, of, of this, the topic. Uh, but here, the way we structured the book, uh, yes, you can find out about uh, various forms of Jewish religion, or various Jewish languages, uh, but you can't, you know, inevitably, you're going to have to find out about various forms of Ukrainian religion and or various you know, forms of Ukrainian language in the process. So it's designed uh, to, to, again, not isolate these cultures and these communities, uh, but to place them in the context uh, of interaction. Uh, it is also done, as you can see by its format, in, in a handsome, reader-friendly fashion. Uh, the text is designed in such a way that any reader uh, of, let's say, at least high school level, or maybe even earlier, uh, can understand and follow uh, uh, the text. So effort was made to make it reader-friendly. So this is not a kind of scholarly tone that it gets boring after a couple of pages. And then it also is enhanced by over 300 illustrations, all of them in color, full color. So it, uh, and then as well, uh, I believe uh, 20 maps designed specifically for this book and also uh, in color. So it's a kind of um, beautiful artifact, uh, aside from having some content uh, of, uh, of value. Uh, now we all know that uh, we all know that the relations between Jews and uh, historical relations between Jews and any other peoples who lived in the lands where they lived in Europe and in other parts of the world uh, were uh, problematic at various times uh, in the historical past. Um, th there'll be adequate time for all kinds of questions uh, of any kind. So, because if I break my train of thought, then I'm lost. Mm -hmm. So please bear with me for a few a few moments. Um, so we know, as I say, that's, that relations uh, have, uh, have been problematic for Jews uh, in any of the societies in which they live. Why? Because they're part of the normal world and there are difficulties in all societies for different kinds of reasons, not only ethnic relations. Um, but one of the things that becomes very clear uh, uh, from this volume uh, is that the first presence of 
Jews on the territory of present-day Ukraine goes back to the early medieval period uh, when this area was part of a large uh, medieval conglomerate of principalities called Kiev and Rus. So, you know, Jews can be attested on the territory of Ukraine for close to a millennium. And hence, I guess that's the subtitle, a millennium of coexistence. Uh, and though there have been problems from time to time, and, and so let, let, let me just backtrack for one sec. It's about a thousand years, but the, the real strong presence uh, began about 450 years ago. Uh, that is, uh, in the uh, late uh, 16th and in particular seven, early 17th century, when large numbers of Jews who were already in the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, of which Ukrainian lands were a part, started to move eastward. So it's really about 450 years that we have a large concentration of Jews living on the territory uh, of Ukraine. It may be difficult to believe for those who are aware to whatever limited degree that when one talks about uh, and reflects on uh, the present day countries of Central Europe and Eastern Europe which would include the old great empires of Austria-Hungary or the Ottoman Empire, certainly the Russian Empire. Uh, the first thing that comes to mind are pogroms and the Holocaust. And that relations between uh, the Jews uh, and the, the dominant, numerically dominant populations among whom they live uh, would be you know, that's, that's all that one remembers. It's, it's kind of what we would call a stereotypical view. Uh, one could call it select memory. And re why I use these terms which I've just used, which may sound un perhaps for some people uncomfortable, is, is that if we take a thousand years of, of presence of Jews on Ukraine, or even 450 years, out of a thousand years or out of 450 years, less than 20 years have been periods of problems. Small scale violence, large scale violence. But 20 out of a thousand, or 20 out of 450. And yet, all that most people remember are these. Uh, these few years in which incidents, terrible incidents, took place, uh, but it hardly is reflective uh, of the much longer periods of, of peace, stability, uh, stable relations, interrelations between Jews, ethnic Ukrainians, and other peoples living on the territory of, of Ukraine. Uh, this question, however, uh, I mean, that, that's just simply historical fact. Uh, the question, however, of what people remember or believe or prefer to want to know about the historical past, that is another kind of question. Uh, and uh, we actually kind of single in on this issue from the very beginning. And so if you open the book, one of the first, uh, aside, because aside from uh, tech, narrative, photographs, maps, we have something called text inserts. These are kind of long commentary-like footnotes mm -hmm. about something that deserves some greater attention, but you don't want to overburden it in the text and to break up the narrative. That's standard thing that are done in textbooks regardless of textbooks of whatever kind, uh, history or not. But the very first of these, this comes in the very first chapter, the second page, and it's called Stereotypes, Misperceptions, and Competing Stories. And what they are is I've chosen 10 
kind of topics. Uh, Kronitsky, Petlura, the Holocaust, collaborate, whatever, with a sentence or two of the Jewish understanding and a sentence or two of the Ukrainian understanding. So already one can see these great contrasts uh, so that we do not try to depict the historical past and these relations by sugarcoating them, uh, but recognizing that attitudes, feelings, beliefs about the interaction, in this case of, of Jews and, and uh, ethnic Ukrainians, are one thing. Such stereotypes existed, and alas, they still exist in many people's minds and the popular mind today. And so we decided to make it clear that we recognize all of this. But then read the rest of the book, and then see after reading the rest of the book whether it's still, it still, it may be valuable or useful to reassess what one's beliefs are uh, after having read the book, which with any book, <laughs> uh, after reading the whole thing, or hopefully one's beliefs, one's feelings, one's attitudes, one's level of knowledge uh, somehow would, will be different, because if not, then why read? <laughs> I mean, this is one of the goals of reading. Uh, so um, uh, these are uh, a few of the things that I wanted to say at the outset in order to give a kind of general a picture of what this uh, particular volume is about. And uh, a book like this uh, it can have relevance beyond the time in which it was written. And as we know, it just so happens that uh, Ukraine has, uh, since this book was conceived, uh, undergone a, a war. Uh, an invasion, uh, uh, basically in two phases. Uh, the first uh, phase of the war began in 2014. Uh, then there was a lull. And th then the second phase of the war began in February 2022, the, a few months ago. And, uh, uh, and as a result of that, there is a need uh, for uh, knowledge about this country, uh, a sore need for it, because uh, it is in the news, it is a subject, unfortunately, of the worst kind, but nonetheless, it's a subject not only of the death and destruction uh, and murder and violence against civilians that is occurring, unfortunately, as we speak, but the information in a volume like this uh, is also necessary uh, for uh, the media who will be continuing to write about it, uh, and certainly uh, diplomats and civil servants who are going to have to be informed uh, during the post-war, uh, 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 post-war diplomatic process. Um, so, uh, if anything, this particular topic, this particular time, uh, has uh, as much relevance as, as ever uh, well, Ukraine has had. So with that, I think I will uh, end my opening uh, remarks, and I know the gentleman right here has some comments, and, and as uh, Natalia indicated at the very outset, uh, feel free to ask any questions of any kind uh, related to the book, which you may or may not have read, and you only got it in your hands a few minutes ago, or anything else that crosses your mind, uh, uh, especially, hopefully, dealing with Central Europe or, or Ukraine, because other issues I don't know if I would be able to answer, but I would tell you if I couldn't. 
sir. I asked for the, uh, the lady, I forgot her name. Natalia. Natalia. Uh, I, I know that uh, Yevgeny Yevtushenko, mm -hmm. uh, Ukraine, uh, in the Soviet uh, time, mm -hmm. he wrote uh, a poem about Babiyan. Mm -hmm. And he uh, was very unique in this uh, period of time while uh, the Soviet regime uh, uh, was uh, anti anti for the Jews and anti for all uh, sympathy of Palestine. My question to you is uh, if you know uh, modern writers or uh, from the past that also wrote about uh, Babia, I mean a short uh, poem or a short uh, poetry song it interests me because uh, my grandfather was uh, the victim of the Nazi. In Babi, yeah. No, not in Babia. Ah, I see. He okay. was in Berlin, the yeah. Gestapo killed him. Right. Well, ironically, uh, this book was prepared uh, for uh, in, con in conjunction with a major week-long series of commemorative events. Uh, that our organization, the Ukrainian Jewish Encounter, uh, organized in the last week of September uh, 2016 on the 75th anniversary uh, of commemoration of Babin Yah, uh, culminating on those last two days of 29 and 30, uh, when the, the shootings and the murder of 38,000 plus uh, Jews of Kiev uh, took place. Um, and for that occasion, uh, we actually prepared two books. Which, uh, the one is this general uh, introductory study to all aspects of uh, Ukrainian uh, uh, culture, past and present, and all aspects of Jewish culture, past and present, and the territory of Ukraine. So that was one book. Well, the second book that we prepared was a more scholarly volume, which is now being reprinted in a purely scholarly ed edition, uh, called Babinyar, History and Memory. Mm. And, th and this came out in, both of these books came out in both English, in an in English edition and Ukrainian edition. And this uh, Babinyar, History and Memory, uh, we conceived of it um, in the broadest sense. Uh, so that uh, just like this book, which doesn't deal sim simply with history, uh, the book on Babinya doesn't deal just simply with what took place at Babinya uh, during that uh, uh, during that fateful week or those fateful two days. I mean, there's there are chapter, there are chapters dealing with that as well, some de detailed chapters dealing with that, uh, but um, uh, the, the it's conceived of in a larger framework, even even with the topographical study as the opening thing of what is physically Babinyar, or what was it, because it has been transformed because of various Soviet developmental projects uh, since that time. Um, and then there's you know kind of setting up what the situation was in interwar years, beginning of German rule. Uh, but then after the World War II and the Holocaust chapters, the, the, the rest of the book, more than half of the book, is a kind of Babinya après Babinya. Uh, and there are separate chapters uh, on, uh, on, on, on oral history, that is, with texts of people who remember, who, you know, who experienced Babinya and were survivors. Uh, there's a chapter on Babinyan literature, and so all of the literature in whatever language uh, that deals specifically with Babinyan, among them Yevtushenko, you'll find it in that chapter. There's a chapter on Babinyan in cinema, uh, Babinyan in art, uh, and uh, so it's, uh, this is precisely the book that you would want. Uh, 
um, and it's literally called Babinya, history and memory. And memory. Uh, Babinya, history and memory. And if you uh, leave you your address and I will contact them, my, 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 and I'm sure Nadia my, would be uh, 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 my, 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 yes, my, 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 uh, answer your question and give you even more. And I have another question to Please. you. Uh, until the until the listeners, would you would you see a difference in the cruelness between uh, Pravoslav uh, or uh, uh, let's say um, Protestant or Catholic? You see uh, any distance and any difference between? between the cruelness of, uh, of let's say, a, a part of the religion that is uh, more, uh, let's say, uh, uh, more... Extreme. Extreme. More extreme, let's say, uh, more Catholic, more, po more Protestantic. You see, you see difference between the cruelness of uh, the two... Uh, versions of, uh, of religion, one is more coolness or one is more, uh, more, uh, more anti-Jews or let's say, it interests me because uh, I, it seems to me that uh, in, in Croatian they were even worse than the, the Serbs, the, the, the Serb or, or the Bosnian Muslims, or, no, or, the, the Croatian were, were uh, you're, you're talking about Croatian, is this Croatian, what you're Croatia. Yeah, Croatia. Croatia, yeah. Okay. Croatia was, was, let's say, more, uh, in some aspect, more, more coolness even than the Nazis, some, some totally. Uh, and uh, um, on uh, the other hand, mm -hmm. if I, I have heard that uh, the Muslims, uh, they, they uh, in the coolness against the Armenian, they uh, they cut the stomach of the pregnant woman, and they they have done uh, dirty work more than uh, the Nazis. They 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 done uh, the, the, with the, with knives, and the Nazis did it more. Uh, let's say three. But uh, my my question is, if there is a difference, if in 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 in, in religion. In, 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 in the level cooler. of yes, love, level of violence and and, and their actual violence. Okay. Um, you're asking one of the big questions, uh, and uh, and a, it's a legitimate big question. Let me first begin by. By, be, by, uh, by the context of the situation in Ukraine and uh, in many other parts of Central and Eastern Europe, uh, but also not in all parts. Very often, well, well, first of all, all of these societies in Central and Eastern Europe, in many ways, they apply also to Spain and, and France, are multinational. What? Multinational. That is, they're made up of different nationalities, or different ethnic groups, or different uh, traditional cultures. However, you you know, but we usually say nationalities, and the and the and the current current term in the 20th century is national minorities. You have a, a dominant state nationality, and then you have other nationalities, national minorities. Um, in the case of Ukraine. Uh, which, was, which in that sense is like many other Central Eastern European countries, but not all again, but many, there is a pretty strong correlation uh, between one's ethnicity or nationality and religion. So, uh, the ethnic Ukrainians were uh, in the, for the most part, Eastern Rite Christians. Uh, 
uh, from the Byzantine tradition. And then there were uh, two subsets of them. There were Eastern Rite Christians that remained within the Orthodox world, and then there were Eastern Rite Christians that entered into union with the Catholic world, maintained their Eastern Rite Christianity, uh, but were, were, were within the framework of the Catholic Church. And no, I didn't say Roman Catholic Church, because the Roman Catholic Church is just one of the rites of the Catholic Church. So the Eastern Rite, Western Rite. But in, so for the main Ukrainians, ethnic Ukrainians, uh, 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 Eastern Christians. The Poles who lived in Ukraine, and traditionally there were hundreds of thousands of them, going back to the 16th and more or less the same time as Jews came into Ukrainian land, so did Poles. Or put another way, the Poles came and the landlords attracted and brought Jews with them. Uh, and they are almost exclusively, if not exclusively, Roman Catholic. Uh, the Crimean Tatars, a distinct nationality, uh, who are exclusively Islamic. Uh, ethnic Germans, who traditionally have lived in, in, uh, uh, in Ukraine, large numbers of them, uh, were uh, all uh, Western Christians whether Roman Catholic or Lutheran Protestant uh, or Mennonites, which is a kind of ultra-Protestant sect, if you will, uh, that didn't interact with the rest of the German. But the point is, is that there was a pretty strong and direct correlation between one's religion and one's nationality. Uh, I'm not going to go into the, the analogous, analogous situation which, which you've used because that will bring us into another world, and that is you know, Roman Catholic Croats, Orthodox Serbs, and, and uh, Muslim, Bosnian Muslims. But though they were of different religions, and where religion, whether in the case of the South Slavs or in the case of the various peoples of Ukraine, uh, traditional religion had certainly an impact on uh, the uh, cultural values of people and uh, the factor that drove them to interact and with violence was motivated in large part by their ethnic differences, but explained by themselves often, not always, uh, in religious terms. So, Kmelnitsky and the Cossacks in the 17th century, Jews have just heard the name because he's in prayers and so forth and so on, and he's the devil incarnate, symbolic, right? Well, <laughs> the Cossacks' whole existence was to liquidate those terrible Roman Catholic Poles, right? And, and those who were allied to Roman Catholic Poles, primarily the other... East, uh, Eastern Rite Christians uh, because the Cossacks were Orthodox Christians and they saw Roman Catholic Poles, well Poles were the enemy because they, they were the landlords and they were the, from their perspective, the, the exploiters. So they were out to kill Poles, which they did first and foremost and fought right, right on. They often explained that because in earlier times people identified more with their religion than with their ethnicity. That's a more modern concept. 
Uh, so it, they were defending the, the Orthodox Rus faith against those Roman Catholic Poles. What's worse, being Roman Catholic or being Pole? Well, in this particular case, it was actually Pole, right? Uh, so the kind of level of violence, I wouldn't say is determined by religious attitudes, because all Christian churches, in one way or another, traditionally have had a negative attitude toward the infidel or the non-Christian, whether it was a Muslim, right? It's the whole story of relations between the Muslims in Europe, uh, or uh, whether it was toward Jews. So, you know, to kind of say, well, you know, were the Orthodox had had a greater level of hatred toward Jews than uh, and and toward Muslims than Roman Catholics. I don't know, or or did the Roman Catholics have a greater hatred toward uh, toward Russians because of their Roman Catholicism or because of their ethnic difference? Regardless, how they would have uh, they would have uh, explained it. And so, uh, the violence and the degree of violence was really motivated primarily, but not always explained in, uh, ethnic terms and nationality terms. Croats detested Serbs because before World War II, Serbs dominated Yugoslavia and did not allow Croatia the promised autonomy and self-rule that it had, and then saw the savior, as did some Ukrainians later on, in Nazi Germany that was going to destroy Yugoslavia, which it did, and this gave them the Croats an opportunity to take revenge against the Serbs. And it was violent, and it was terrible, right? But it was not yeah, they were Catholic against Orthodox, but it was really the, because they were against the Serbs. Because they could have taken the same level of violence out against the Macedonians, who were also Orthodox. It was the idea of uh, you know, being anti-Serbian. And we see this being played out today. I mean, here we have you know, two traditionally Orthodox peoples. Well, the Russians are, crea are, are, are committing all kinds of horrendous acts and and, uh, and war crimes with a deep-seated, visceral hatred for Ukrainians as Ukrainians. Now, they're, they're all about the same religion and very often the same speak the same language. But it's, you know, yeah. they're associating it with an ethnic group which they feel is a threat to them. Now, whether Ukrainians are an existential threat to Russians is a different story. Russians believe it, and especially if they get you know a barrage of propaganda from, uh, from the state, and, and in modern terms, a totalitarian state that control. So it's not it's, here again. Um, uh, to make a long story short, uh, it's difficult for me to comment on uh, more or less hatred, violence, based on uh, of one religion, more so than another. Okay, we, we don't have any um, time, but just a quick question, if you can, uh, I saw that in the book there is a chapter dedicated to languages. Yes. And so if you can give us a little bit uh, um, of your uh, uh, research about the connection of the Yiddish, the Korean, the, the, the Yiddish, connection of of the, between the languages, yes. from Yiddish, uh, Ukrainian, Ukrainian, and the Hebrew, the Hebrew of today, the speaking Hebrew that we are using here. Ah, okay. Uh, okay, no, not the uh, uh, not the uh, Hebrew that you happen to meet uh, mm -hmm. from uh, mm -hmm. yeah. abroad. Okay, well, first of all, both in, uh, to begin with, in many ways, both Ukrainians and Jews, ethnic Ukrainians and Jews, um, uh, have great similarities 
uh, in terms of uh, the, 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 in terms of language or the language factor, namely that both of these peoples historically have used different languages. Uh, and when we say language, the first thing we have to distinguish is what are we talking about? Because there are two basic two basic forms of language. There's spoken language and written language. Uh, so, and both of these peoples, actually, in their history uh, uh, in Ukraine, spoke one thing and often read and or wrote or were educated in something else. Um, in the case of ethnic Ukrainians, this was a long process in which uh, the predominant language that was used for educational purposes and for intellectual discourse well into the uh, early 19th century uh, was a religious language, a liturgical language, which is called Church Slavonic. People didn't speak Church Slavonic. Uh, what they spoke were their uh, local and regional East Slavic, some form of East Slavic, one of the East Slavic dialects, right, which later then became to be known as Ukrainian. Uh, but as I say, in education and writing and reading, it was Church Slavonic, and it was a slow, pro it was a long process to get away from Church Slavonic uh, to a language that would be codified and based on the spoken forms. Uh, and even that was not directly because in between, the intelligentsia would say, well, okay, Church Slavonic is not our language. We should have something that's closer to the spoken forms, but what would that be? Many of them, in the 19th century, and this was a struggle in the Ukrainian intellectual world, uh, uh, chose Russian. Basically saying, you know, uh, Russian is already existing, um, and we, Ukrainians, or people from Ukraine, which is another thing that people don't realize, contributed in an enormous amount to Russian intellectual <laughs> life, uh -huh. right? There's a whole period in the 17th century in Russian intellectual history, which is called the Ukrainian period. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so this is a long tradition, and that also goes for language. Hmm? Mm -hmm. And so many Ukrainians felt rightly so that the literary form of Russian, they had contributed to it anyway, mm -hmm. right? Um, and then, then you had others saying, no, just like Church Slavonic is certainly very far from the spoken popular language, Russian is also maybe not as far, but far. And so one should develop a language based directly on the spoken language. And the two symbols of that in the 19th century in Ukraine were Nikolai Gogol, Ukrainian mm -hmm. pure and thin, chose to use Russian and became one of the greatest Russian language writers of the 19th century. Mm -hmm. And the other writer, uh, Taras Shevchenko, who also wrote in Russian, but decided for the people to, and for his things that were close to his heart, poetry in mm -hmm. particular, to create and use the spoken language, and hence he became the national bard. So this kind of split uh, in, in Ukrainian society uh, with regard to language was a, a, a quote-unquote a normal phenomenon, normal phenomenon in the uh, uh, in the 19th century, and it was continued in the into the 20th century. And that's why and then, of course, with the existence of the Soviet Union, who declared that Russian was the most important language and gave it prestige. So you had this bilingualism, if you will. When we look at Jews, we have the same, in many ways, a similar situation. 
um, in that uh, the uh, language of the Jews of Ukraine, as well as for most of Central and Eastern Europe, was Yiddish, which we all know is you know a late late medieval German dialect, probably somewhere from the Rhine Valley near the Palatinate, that that then got in, uh, evolved first on in in Germanic lands, and then was brought to uh, to to Central Europe and Eastern Europe, first to the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, then to Lithuania, Belarus, Ukraine, etc., Moldova, and you had developed various forms of Yiddish, right? But it's still this was a Germanic um, a Germanic language, but because of because of tradition, just like Ukraine, just like the Roman Catholics had Latin, the East Slavs had Church Slavonic. So the liturgical language of Jews was uh, was Hebrew. Um, and the, the, the only kind of difference here is, is that Hebrew was, that, that Yiddish technically could have been rendered in uh, in um, in the Roman alphabet or the Latin alphabet, and not, but they chose Hebrew to to kind of distinguish themselves and or relate themselves somehow to the traditional culture, even though no one spoke Hebrew at the time. But then you know, as you well know, you have this Hebrew revival in you beginning in Ukraine. Odessa was a very important center for the Hebrew revival at the beginning of the 20th century. And then, you know, culminating with the first, uh, you know, Congress of the of the Jewish languages uh, that was held of all places in Ukraine in Chernivtsi mm -hmm. uh, in 1908, uh, and to decide, well, which one of these two languages is going to be the one that should be representative of Jews? And as you know, they they fudged the answer, and they just basically said both. <laughs> and so then you had a then, then history plays itself out. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so that's the kind of formal part of the answer to your question. I believe the other form, the other part of the answer to your question, in terms of interrelations between Jews and Ukrainians, uh, are there interrelations that can be seen in uh, uh, in uh, between Ukrainian. Uh, spoken Ukrainian, in particular spoken Ukrainian, and, and, and for all intents and purposes spoken Yiddish. And the answer to that is there are different forms of Yiddish, and all forms of Yiddish are influenced in, 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 by vocabulary uh, from either the Slavic or the Lithuanian speakers with whom they've interacted. Uh, and uh, the, you know, the, the number of loan words, as an example, uh, varies from excuse me, Yiddish dialect to Yiddish dialect in Central and Eastern Europe. Mm -hmm. That is also discussed here mm -hmm. uh, 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 in the chapter on, uh, on language, mm -hmm. or languages. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very so, much. So I think, yes, so thank you very much, Professor Malvichi. Um And I invite you to look at our website, ukrainianjewishencounter.org, to find out um, more about our activities and particularly now uh, to get co to read commentary uh, in English and in Ukrainian, um, and there is some Russian um, uh, commentary on the current war in Ukraine, um, and to get a different perspective on that. So thank you very much for thank coming you. today. Thank you very thank much. You. I would like to give my uh, yes, yes.